just want to thank uh, Pastor Shane for reading that scripture and for introducing me. Uh, indeed, I was a student of his, and um, I declare it was one of the best classes I ever took. I learned so much, uh, Pastor Shane, in his class that um, I think my entire preaching has been enhanced dramatically. If any of you ever have a chance to take a class from from Pastor Shane, I encourage you to do so. He's indeed a man of rich knowledge. And I have something in common with, with all the pastors here because uh, Pastor Shane was my professor at La Sierra and then Pastor Luke, well, you know, his first name is my middle name, amen? And so Pastor Luke and I are connected through our naming. And then of course, Pastor Mark, well, you know, the Bible says in Psalm 37, 37, Mark the perfect man. <laughs> Amen. Mark the perfect man. And so I'm just so happy to be able to be with you here today and to share God's word uh, on this great morning. I'm going to put this down here. I want to just share with you briefly on the subject I've entitled Getting God's Attention. Getting God's Attention. Why don't you just turn to your neighbor and tell him you got to get God's attention. Get, getting God's attention. Pray with me, gracious God. Speak now. In the stillness while we wait on you, hushed our hearts to answer in expectancy. And in this quiet little moment, be to us a word that's power. Amen. How do people of faith get God's attention? In a world racked with war, torn by terror, and hemorrhaging with suffering, while millions grope for answers in a dark, cold, and creepy world, in times like these, Christians seek connection and refuge in God. And in that two-way contact, God hears us and we hear God. But when that connection breaks, both God and God's people struggle to get each other's attention. And after three raging storms, five unsettling earthquakes, the worst mass shooting in modern U.S. history, and a looming conflict with North Korea, most people of faith today just wonder, uh, how do I get the assurance of God's abiding presence? And just like these biblical post-exilic people, we may ask, how do I get God's comfort, God's protection, and God's attention? But for these ancient people of faith seeking connection with a seemingly inattentive God, God says to the prophet, never mind getting my attention, you get their attention. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and tell my people their sins. God instructs the people, the prophet, to go against all accepted norms, violate their vaulted values of decency, and cry aloud, breach their personal privacy, and tell their business publicly, suspend their subtle sensibilities, and don't hold back. Get the attention of these so-called good, temple-going, animal-sacrificing, commandment-keeping, Sabbath-observing, praying, fasting, post-exilic people of God and tell them about their sins. God says, speak this message to so-called good people, not the pagan worshipers of Baal and Nebo and Molech or Ashtoreth or those deaf, dumb, and dead gods can't see, hear, or speak. We know already 
We know this already because prophet Elijah taunted those same pagan worshipers. They begged and pleaded and sang and danced and prayed to their gods. They tried everything they could, but Baal didn't hear and Nebo didn't answer and Molech didn't help and Ashtoreth didn't move. But now the house of Israel faces a similar crisis because they no longer hear from the true and living God. They worship, they fast, and they pray, but they feel like somehow they just can't get God's attention. They felt God become blind, deaf, and dumb like those pagan gods. So now the true and living God says, I want you to tell this house of Jacob about their sins. Prophesy after the exile to interpret past and present judgment. Tell this message to a released and restored people who want to be good but just don't know how. The reader can find messages of future judgment for other nations in previous chapters, but in Isaiah 58, 1 to 10, the prophet speaks to a people God had already judged in the Babylonian captivity, the house of Jacob. They now tried harder to do better and be more faithful. They called themselves the people of God. But while they worshipped, prayed, and fasted, they agonized. And while they studied God's word and God's way, they cried. You could hear them complaining and asking, why can't we get God's attention? Why does God not hear? Why won't God help us with our lives and protect us and comfort us? I hear them say, why should should I pray any longer? Why should I fast anymore? God, you don't even notice and you don't even hear. What do you do when you feel like you can't get God's attention? What do you do when it seems like God does not hear your cry? How do you handle dark despair, cold cheerlessness, and creepy circumstances all alone without the assurance of God's presence? And how do you help others struggling with this same predicament? Here God addresses their concern with this prophetic plain talk. You fast and worship to look good while making profit. But during your fast, you hit the poor with your fist. You win in life and get on top, but all others get to sink to the bottom and lose. You're only fasting to pretend like you're on my side, but deep down you're just looking out for yourselves. Oh, what a sham you pull and what a lie you tell. Who do you think you're fooling? The God of heaven? I see through your lies and I hear your false piety. How dare you call it prayer when you don't live to be the hands and feet of the God who answers prayer? How dare you call your fast real when what you do in your daily life is so unreal and fraudulent? How dare you say you love God when you don't love the ones God loves? How dare you claim uh, faithfulness to God when you think you could fool the God of the faithful? But then the focus shifts from these false worshipers complaining about God to the very God they're complaining to. God asks the question in verse 5, do you think this is the kind of fast I'm looking for? Do I want you to show off your humility? Do I want mere mechanical meaningless ritual? Do I want outward sorrow but no heartfelt remorse? That may be the kind of fast the pagan gods accept. The pagans believed their gods took the side of the rich, you know, and they aligned with the rich but neglected the poor, the widows, and the strangers. But our God is different. Riches don't get God's attention. In Psalm 68 verse 5, God claims to be a father to the fatherless and a defender of the widow. That's the poor. Proverbs 19 17 said, whoever helps the poor lends to God. And in Isaiah 58, we hear God saying, I ain't hearing you unless you get your heart Get rid of exploitation in the marketplace. 
Free the oppressed, cancel their debts. Instead of your fasting, take your bread and go eat with the hungry. Instead of afflicting your souls in sadness, invite the homeless, sad, and afflicted into your homes. Instead of putting on sackcloth and ashes, go clothe the naked. Do this. Then the light of God's glory will shine through you. Then your prayers will go up, and God will say, Here I am. But even after God's judgment on the house of Jacob, these restored post-exilic people of God could not do this. And the record of this instruction to preach this prophetic sermon to a released people forms the evidence that captivity, adversity, and hardship cannot change the heart. It may alter your resolve, but it won't make you live right. Their ego and pride won't let them see that everything they had was a gift from God. Their wealth, their strength, their wisdom to get money, all of it came from God. In Isaiah 29, 13, God cites the problem. This people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me by delivering this message to an exiled people. God demonstrates that even repentant, God-fearing people cannot produce all that God wants from them, no matter how much they try. That's why, though they tried, they couldn't get God's attention. Have you ever felt this frustration? You try, but God looks away from you. You work hard, but God never even winks at you. You do your best, but God does not smile at you. Have you ever asked these questions here at the Vallejo Drive Seventh-day Adventist Church? How do I get God's attention? What causes God to stir on the throne and look my way? If you have, then in some way this passage tells your story. But here's the bad news. These people have a heart problem. Only hearts aligned with God's heart can get God's attention. Fasting and praying don't get God's attention unless the heart is right. But wait, there's even more bad news. No man or woman, boy or girl, can align their heart with God's heart. God and God alone must fix the human heart. And for God to get what God wants from God's people, then God must do something more for God's people. We are not get up in here today and look down at these folks in the text because we can't do what God wants either without God. Unless God changes our hearts, we will never be aligned with God. And in Ezekiel 36, 26, God speaks to these same exiled people and promises to give them a new heart and a new spirit. God says, I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And in the gospel story, God gets our attention through the great love displayed on the cross. And in the gospel story, God expresses that his love for humanity is so profound that he's willing to change every human heart and every human life. Paul declares in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. In Christ Jesus, God not only fulfills the promise of Ezekiel 36, 26, to bring and give us a new heart, but he also satisfies the demands of Isaiah 58. In Luke 4, 18, Christ himself answers the demands of our passage. Christ Jesus proclaims that he came to preach the gospel to the poor and heal the brokenhearted and preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In his work and life, Jesus fulfilled the perfect righteous fast and prayer and work and justice God demands. Oh, hallelujah, for the Lamb of God this morning. He fasted and he got God's attention. He prayed and got God's attention. He fed the hungry and he is the bread of life for every hungry soul. He not only did righteousness, but he himself is righteousness and he clothes all of us with his robe of righteousness. On the cross, God crucified the entirety of the human family. He crucified all our human pride and our evil. The cross cast the selfishness and the pride and the glory of man in the dust so that now with hearts that are new and aligned with the heart of God, we can be God's eyes and God's hands and God's feet in this world. We can make a real 
difference in a dark and cold and creepy world because the perfect antidote to dark, cold, and creepy is light, warm, and fuzzy. Cozy, light, warm, and cozy, you know. And what gives us joy this morning is that after the cross, God turns your light on. Verse 8 says, Then shall your light break free like the morning. The Message Bible puts it this way. Do this, and the lights will turn on in your life. Whenever I call in the name of Jesus, I get God's attention. God hears and answers and says, Here am I. When I need God most, God's presence draws near, and God turns my lights on. How do I know? I know because that's my testimony. I'm all wrapped up and tied up in God's program, you see. I testify I used to be fixated on my own agenda uh, at one time, but God changed my heart and turned my lights on. I know my story is your story, so go on and say amen if you feel like it. I do declare I'm not what I used to be because Jesus changed me and made me his child, and now I get God's attention anytime I need it. Uh-huh, mm-hmm, I do declare I'm now one of his sons, and yes, I know I'm a child of God, just like all of you here this morning. How do I know I'm a child of God? I know because he pays the child support. <laughs> That's right, he takes care of me, hallelujah. How do I know? I know because he changed my name. He changed me completely. He says, a new name will I give you. How do I know? I know because he always stops to pick me up when I fall. How do I know? I know because like verse 8 of this passage says, he turned this little light of mine on. And now he always sends me on soul-saving missions to shine the light of God's love for others who are lost in darkness and looking to hear his voice. You see, while I've been trying to get God's attention, God's been trying to get mine. But God's goal was not so much to get my attention. God just wanted to turn my light on and let my light shine. And that's my testimony. That's all I came to say today, that I must be a child of God. I know I'm a child of God. Now, oh, I got to quit now, but I'll never forget it. One day, as I flew from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, over to London, England, to preach for some evangelistic meetings, I was so tired, I boarded that plane with every intention of getting some sleep, but God said, sleep nothing, let your little light shine. And I got seated next to a young man who just couldn't stop talking. Some of you know the type I'm talking about. He proceeded to tell me all about his life story, and all I could do was just sit there and say, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, I see, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'll never forget it. He told me, he said, you know, I work with my dad. He said, we run a company called Dawn and Son. Dawn and Sons. And our head office is in New Jersey. And he said, we service all the lights for all the runways in North America. And every now and then when there's an emergency, his father calls him and sends him out to represent the company and fix the specialized lighting system of all the runways and all the airports. And then he leaned closer to me and he said, and, and what is it that you do, mister? Oh, I knew I had him. Without missing a beat, I said, well, I work with my daddy, too. <laughs> we run a company called God and Sons. God and, God and Sons? I said, yeah, God and Sons. We supply and service the lights for all the planets. And every now and then, my daddy sends me out on a, on a mission, critical emergency errand journey to rescue folks caught in darkness. Oh, but all of you here at the Vallejo Drive Seventh-day Adventist Church form vital parts of this great company, God and Sons and Daughters. Amen, somebody. Amen. We're all children of God. We're lit with the flame of God's love. No storm can stop us. No earthquake can destroy us. No gunman can vanquish our light. No war can end our message of life and hope and love and joy and peace. Thus, God called us here, right here, to shine a light that illuminates all the darkness right here in this community. If you get on God's program, God's eyes rest upon you. You'll have God's comfort, God's protection, and yes, God's attention. 
As I begin my ministry here at this great community of faith, I know somebody here today wants God to change your heart, give you a new heart, and turn your light on. If that's your desire, I just invite you to stand with me, with me right where you are. I want to pray for you right now. Just will you stand with me real quick right now. Gracious God, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, O God, for the power of the gospel that shines with a luminous and glory in our lives, bringing transformation for our darkness and a light that not only lights up our life, but is bright enough to light this entire community. We thank you for this great community of faith. For every member, bless us here right now. May your spirit abide for all of us who desire your power, your grace, your goodness, and your glory in our lives to be that shining light. Bless us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Remain standing with me as we sing that, that great song we learned so many years ago, 580, This Little Light of Mine, This Little Light of Mine. 